Good morning. Today we'll be looking at chapter two of Bloody Times, the funeral of Abraham Lincoln and the manhunt for Jefferson Davis. Begins on page 184 at the very top. Chapter two. On March 23rd at 1 p.m., Lincoln left Washington, bound south on the ship River Queen. His wife Mary came with him along with their son Tad. A day later, the vessel anchored off City Point, Virginia, headquarters of General Grant and the armies of the United States. Lincoln met with his commanders to discuss the war. General William Tecumseh Sherman asked Lincoln about his plans for Jefferson Davis. Many in the North wanted Davis hanged if he was captured. Did Lincoln think so too? Lincoln answered Sherman by saying that all he wanted was for the Southern armies to be defeated. He wanted the Confederate soldiers sent back to their homes, their farms, and their shops. Lincoln didn't answer Sherman's question about Jefferson Davis directly, but he told a story. There was a man, Lincoln said, who had sworn never to touch alcohol. He visited a friend who offered him a drink of lemonade. Then the friend suggested that the lemonade would taste better with a little brandy in it. The man replied that if some of the brandy were to get into his lemonade, unbeknown to him, that would be fine. Sherman believed that Lincoln meant it would be the best thing for the country if Jefferson Davis were simply leave and never return. As the Union president, Lincoln could hardly say in public that he wanted a man who had been a rebel against his government to get away without punishment. But if Davis were to escape, unbeknown to him, as Lincoln seemed to be suggestion, suggesting that would be fine. At City Point, Lincoln received reports and sent messages. He haunted the Army Telegraph office for news of the battles raging in Virginia. He knew that soon Robert E. Lee must make a major decision. Would he sacrifice his army in a final hopeless battle to defend Richmond? Or would he abandon the Confederate capital and save his men to fight another day? In the afternoon of April 2nd, just one day later, Lee telegraphed another warning to Jefferson Davis in Richmond. I think it absolutely necessary that we should abandon our position tonight, he wrote. Lee had made his choice. His army would retreat. Richmond would be captured. Davis packed some clothes, retrieved important papers and letters from his private office, and waited at the mansion. The messenger brought him word. The officials of his government had assembled at the station. The train that would carry the president and the cabinet of the Confederacy was loaded and ready to depart. Davis and a few friends left the White House, mounted their horses, and rode to the railroad station. Crowds did not line the streets to cheer their president or to shout best wishes for his journey. The citizens of Richmond were locking up their homes, hiding their valuables, or fleeing the city before the Yankees arrived. Throughout the day and into the night, countless people left however they could, on foot, on horseback, in carriages, in carts, or in wagons. Some rushed to the railroad station, hoping to catch the last train south. Few would escape. But not all of Richmond's inhabitants dreaded the capital's fall. Among the blacks of Richmond, the mood was happy. At the African church, it was a day of jubilation. Worshippers poured into the streets, congratulated one another, and prayed for the coming of the Union Army. When Jefferson Davis got to the station, he hesitated. Perhaps the fortunes of war had turned in the Confederacy's favor that night. Perhaps Lee had defeated the enemy after all, as he had done so many times before. For an hour, Davis held the loaded and waiting train in hopes of receiving good news from Lee. That telegram never came. The Army of the Northern Virginia would not save Richmond from its fate. Dejected, the president boarded the train he did not have a private, luxurious sleeping car built for the leader of a country. Davis took his seat in a common coach packed with officials of the government. The train gathered steam and crept out of the station at a slow speed, no more than 10 miles per hour. It was a humble 
sobering departure for the president of the Confederate States of, of America from his capital city. As the train rolled out of Richmond, most of the passengers were somber. There was nothing left to say. It was near midnight, Postmaster General John Reagan on board the train remembered, when the president and his cabinet left the heroic city. As our train, frightfully overcrowded, rolled along toward Danville, we were oppressed with sorrow for those we left behind and the fears for the safety of General Lee and his army. The presidential train was not the last one to leave Richmond that night. A second one carried another cargo from the city, the treasure of the Confederacy, half a million dollars in gold and in silver coins, plus deposits from the Richmond banks. Captain William Parker, an officer in the Confederate States Navy, was put in charge of the treasure and ordered to guard it during the trip to Danville. Men desperate to escape Richmond, who had failed to make it onto the Davis's train, climbed aboard their last hope, the treasure train. The wild mood at the station alarmed Parker, and he ordered his men, some were only boys, to guard the doors and not allow another soul to enter. Once Jefferson Davis was gone, and as the night wore on, Parker witnessed the breakdown of order. The whiskey was running in the gutters and men were getting drunk upon it. Large numbers of ruffians suddenly sprang into existence. I suppose thieves, deserters, who had been hiding. If the mob learned that the cargo Parker and his men guarded, then the looters, driven by greed, would have attacked that train. Parker was prepared to order his men to fire on the crowd. Before that became necessary, the treasure train got up steam and followed Jefferson Davis into the night. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, stick with the plan. I'm actually recording right now, uh, me reading chapter two. Okay. Well, I'm going to go check the Yeah. Cool. Yeah, no problem. The bottom left box should be filled in today, as well as uh, the first three words on vocabulary. Connotation is going to be tough. It just is. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, bye. After that short, brief interlude. To add to the chaos caused by the mobs, soon there would be fire, and it would not be the Union troops who would burn the city. The Confederates accidentally set their own city afire when they burned supplies to keep them from Union hands. The flames spread out of control and reduced much of the capital to ruins. Union troops outside Richmond would see the fire and hear the explosions. About two o'clock in the morning of April 3rd, bright fires were seen in the direction of Richmond. Shortly after, while we were looking at these fires, we heard explosions. One, wit one witness reported, on the way to Danville, the president's train stopped at Clover Station. It was three o'clock in the morning. There, a young army lieutenant, 18 years old, saw the train pull in. He spotted Davis through the window, waving to the people gathered at the station. Later, he witnessed the treasure train pass and the others did too. I saw a government on wheels, he said. From one car in the rear, a man cried out to no one in particular, Richmond's burning, gone, all gone. As Jefferson Davis continued his journey to Danville, Richmond burned and Union troops approached. Around dawn, a black man who had escaped the city reached Union lines and reported what Lincoln and U.S. Grant the commanding general of the armies of the United States suspected. The Confederate government had abandoned the capital during the night and the road to the city was open. There would be no battle for Richmond. The Union army could march in and occupy the rebel capital without firing a shot. The first Union troops entered Richmond shortly after sunrise on Monday, April 3rd. 
They marched through the streets, arrived downtown, and took control of government buildings. They tried to put out the fires, which still burned in some sections of the city. Just a few hours since Davis had left, the White House of the Confederacy was seized by, by the Union and made into their new headquarters. At this point, you need to complete the bottom left box of the notes section and work on the first three words of vocabulary. Whew.